and thanks for coming. I know many of you are, are from Marquette, and actually I just uh, initiated some collaboration with Dr. Amy Van Hackey at Marquette, so you may also see me at your campus. Um, this is the topic of today's presentation. Um, when people think about biomedical engineering, people think about applying technology on um, uh, physical health. And my research is another type. It's a, new, it's a type of newer research is, uh, is how to apply technologies to help people keep their mental health. So when we are talking about mental health, we are talking about psychological disorders. There are many types of psychological disorders. Uh, I think you, you, you already heard of uh, major depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, dementia, and I'm dealing with autism. So uh, when a patient has uh, a psychological disorder, there are two ways to treat the problem. So one way is psychiatric medication. So basically, uh, they can take pills to suppress the symptoms. Or they can do cognitive behavioral um, therapy. So in this therapy, um, therapists try to um, understand uh, the patient's cognitive pattern and uh, try to change their behaviors accordingly. Usually, the most effective way is to do the combination uh, of the two. Uh, the result is better than um, do either this one or this one. So uh, I design intelligent systems um, to help children with autism um, um, to solve their cognitive and behavioral um, problems. This is a general type of research uh, in human machine interaction. So regarding machine, we are talking about computers, we talk about robots, and some other people also use mobile devices as the machine. So the systems are designed for children with autism spectrum disorder, or ASD. Why we are studying this disorder? Because Many children, they are suffering from this disorder. One in 68 children in the United States. And this disorder has two important features. One is social communication impairments, and the other is repetitive and atypical patterns of behavior. And the cost of caring in life is over $3 million per person, so it's very, very expensive. And uh, um, my research mainly address the social communication impairments. Um, this type of research uh, is interdisciplinary research between technology, uh, I mean engineering, and psychology. So uh, an important question is, where am I? Am I more inclined to technology, or am I doing more psychological work? I would say um, I'm here. Mainly, I do um, technical work, um, but at the same time, I have to understand developmental psychology in order to do my research. Uh, and here, shows the basic stages in my research, or in this type of research. Uh, first, we think about what are, we, what, 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 what are we trying to solve? What type of system we have to develop? That is the design part. And after that, we develop intervention systems, like including programming, including hardware design. And then we use the design system to do user study, or human subject, experimental studies. So in, in these studies, um, we uh, recruit real people with autism, and we ask them, we, uh, we instruct them to interact with the system that we developed and see um, 
how it goes. So after the user study, of course, we will do data analysis. We want to um, look at the procedure and the result in fine resolution. So you see that this type of research uh, takes a long time. Usually, one research cycle takes two years. And it's a little bit longer than other type of biomedical engineering studies, such as image processing, uh, signal processing. Um, but the good thing is you get a chance to interact with real people and see their, the change of their behaviors, right? So it's a bonus. Um, so why we can use machine to help children with autism? That is a fundamental question. If we want to design something for them, then we have to answer this question, why can we do it? Um, so there are two important reasons. One is children with ASD, they have difficulties in discriminating and screening out unnecessary information from overall meaning or from the main communication stream. So for example, um, if here is a kid with ASD sitting here and trying to understand my speech. Uh, instead of paying attention to, uh, to my speech, maybe my uh, facial expression is very distractive to this kid. Maybe while I'm wearing the color of my uh, sweater uh, um, attract their attention more than what I'm talking. So using technology, using machine-assisted um, technology, we can present information. Here I mean communication information in a way that only the primary information is conveyed and all the unnecessary information are eliminated. So instead of I doing the speech, if I program a robot to do my speech, then I can program the robot in a way that there's no facial expression and I can paint the robot uh, using some non-destructive color, right? So they will have less difficulties uh, in understanding the conversation. Another reason is children with ASD, they prefer non-biological motions instead of biological motions. This is a very interesting phenomenon. So of course, if you are using a machine, then you provide non-biological motions, right? So that's the main reasons why we can use uh, hardwares, we can develop <coughs> intelligent systems to, to help these children. Um, this research has been done for decades. And uh, here are some examples of uh, previous works. So people uh, developed some robots, uh, this is Kipong, and the robot can um, tilt its head and make some uh, make different sound. And this is the Casper. This is a very famous uh, robot uh, developed uh, in the UK. And the robot can talk to uh, children, and it ha also has some sensors embedded, so children can uh, squeeze its head and uh, can touch touch its face and, and etc. And uh, there are also technologies um, such as virtual reality, and this is a, a, a simulated social conversation environment. And also people use virtual reality to investigate how um, people with ASD, uh, adolescents with ASD, uh, drive. Uh, we cannot ask them to drive real cars because of the potential risks, but we can develop the virtual driving environment for them to be able to engage in driving. Now the question is, uh, what's the difference between this and this? And why many people use robot? Can you guess why? Okay, the answer is, Using robot, you kind of provide physical embodiment. And that physical embodiment naturally um, um, uh, creates more engagement. So a famous professor, Brian Scazzoletti, uh, he's at Yale. Uh, he did a very interesting study. He recruited um, 
uh, students, not, not people with ASD, and uh, they did experiment in his own office. They uh, use a robot, uh, give different instructions to the students, and one of the instructions was throw a $500 uh, textbook into the trash can. Um, and when they did the experiment using the robot, the student did not hesitate. They went ahead and threw the expensive textbook into the trash can. However, when they use the recorded video of the robot and display that on a screen, um, many students hesitated. They, they were like, am I going to do this? This is so expensive. Am I supposed to throw this textbook uh, into the trash can? So you can see the importance of embodiment, physical embodiment. <coughs> that is one of the reasons why we use robots. Um, and in the traditional works, usually <coughs> the interaction uh, is just a free play. The researchers, they bring the robot in a room and, and just uh, encourage the children to interact with the robot. They, they may like wave to the robot. They may touch the hand of the robot, and etc., etc. And, et and uh, the response from the participants needs to be observed by human um, um, observers. And if the robot want to give some feedback based on the behavior of the children then the robot needs to be controlled by human operators. So it's, this, is, this means people are just using uh, the, the physical <coughs> capability of the robot, but the, uh, the recognition, the brain of the robot is actually uh, the recognition of human, the analysis of human being, the human operator hiding behind the scene. So this type of research is called without of all's research. Okay. Um, I did something different. So first, instead of doing free play, since psychologists already find if an intervention is oriented to a particular core deficits or impairments of that disorder, then the intervention itself is, is more effective so for example, if children, uh, if, a, if a child uh, uh, is lack of joint attention skill, then it's better to create an interaction scenario that focus on joint attention instead of other things, right? And I develop al um, alternative detection uh, algorithms. Um, so which means I, uh, my system can track and, and um, analyze the behavior, the interaction cues of the subjects automatically. So you do not have to uh, um, hire an operator um, to observe the participant, right? The system can do it by, by itself. And the system can provide adaptive feedback to the subjects. So once the system understands what is going on, and the system can provide feedback to the, to the participant uh, ac according to the participant's behavior. Okay. So that's the difference between my research and the, 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 the traditional research. And there are three important requirements uh, in designing intelligent intervention systems for uh, these children. One is the system must be created in a way that it can be accepted, it can be tolerated by these children. It sounds very easy, but actually not. Since um, children with ASD, they have uh, abnormal sensory profile. So a lot of things uh, which are not offensive to us may, be, may seem like over, very overwhelming for these children. And um, the second requirement is we have to create a system in a way that it can attract attention from the participant. In order to teach a participant anything, to change their behavior, at least you have to grab their attention first, right? And then 
we want the system be able to elicit desired skills. If a child with ASD uh, cannot do joint attention tasks very well, and then we want to develop a system that can help them do joint attention. So, um, how should the robot interact with the participant? As I mentioned, we should conduct a meaningful intervention, or we have to solve the core deficits of ASD. And we have to have effective interaction logic. We need to maintain their engagement. Uh, it is related to attention, and we have to improve their performance. This is related to uh, whether we can elicit desired behaviors. Okay. And uh, how to track participants' behaviors? We will need to design interaction cue sensing. This is the major part that can facilitate the interaction logic. And actually, the interaction cue sensing is the most difficult task in such uh, type of research. And after we develop the interaction logic, we build a robot, and we uh, design the interaction cue sensing uh, components, the next question is how to integrate and coordinate different components we need an effective system architecture. And those feels very uh, abstract. Uh, so I will give you a case study uh, to explain those more. So the case study is on joint attention intervention. What is joint attention? Joint attention means different individuals, they share their attention on the same object. Now currently, you and I share our attention on my slides. This is joint attention. Okay. But many children with ASD, they cannot share their attention. They cannot coordinate their attention uh, with other people. So um, we try to develop technologies to help them uh, conquer this deficit. Um, this study, uh, um, was done, I mean, I did it for about five or six years. So in the first stage, I think it was around 2011 or 2012, um, our research group uh, want to investigate whether the children with ASD can uh, respond to the instruction given by a robot. Okay? So what they did was they recruit uh, uh, a few children with ASD and they program the robot so the robot can, uh, could point at different target monitors mounted in the room. Uh, and uh, after the child robot interaction, they also uh, hire a human therapist to do the same thing. So we can compare the effect between a human and a robot. So what we find was, first, the robot, uh, so the participants, they paid more attention to the robot uh, compared with the human therapist. And secondly, the robot can elicit, could elicit comparable joint attention performance uh, comparing with the human therapist. So this pilot study was successful. This pilot study encouraged us to do more work. But there was a big issue in this study. So this is the head used to indicate the direction of the children's attention. So how this worked was um, you see a, a line of uh, infrared LED. And we also mounted the uh, infrared camera on the ceiling. So if the kid turned the head to, towards a robot or target, and then we can track the vector of the, uh, of the LED using the infrared camera, right? So that's how we indicate the, the direction of their attentions. But as I mentioned, 
Children with ASD, they have abnormal sensory profile. And over 30% of the participant, they couldn't tolerate wearing the hat. And they just dropped the study. So basically, this means the conclusion we got here, um, uh, are, were based on um, the data from the children who could tolerate the hats. So that was the problem. And in addition, the, uh, the experiment was a one-visit experiment. The children came to the lab and did uh, the study and then left, only one visit. So we do not know the longitudinal impact of the robot. So um, in the next stage, we, want to, we wanted to study whether the result hold using non-invasive gaze tracking. The gaze indicated attention. And uh, what, what was the robot, the impact of the robot over time? So in stage B, uh, we designed another system. Here is the robot, and the participant was seated in a chair in front of the robot two targets, one on the left side, another on the right side. So um, instead of wearing the hat, we hired, we hired a therapist sitting behind the scene. And uh, she clicked a button if the participant look at the target monitor following the instruction of the robot. So basically, the robot said, uh, look over there. And if the child responded, then the therapist clicked the button. So again, this is a visit of all system. But at least all the participants finished the study. No dropout. So we can get a more concrete conclusion uh, about the impact of robot. Um, again, we recruited a few children with ASD. And uh, we did four sessions on different days to assess the longitudinal impact to some extent. The acceptance rate was a hundred percentage, as I mentioned. And uh, we find that um, the preferential attention towards the robot, uh, um, so uh, on the, uh, in the first session was high. And this interest uh, uh, lasted across the whole procedure. So it, the attention paid on the robot did not decrease significantly from session one to session four. Okay. And the performance of their joint attention improved significantly. So um, this encouraged us to do stage C, the next stage. In the next stage, we want to create an autonomous system instead of using the Wizard of Oz mechanism. So what we did was develop, uh, developing fully autonomous system with non-invasive gaze tracking. So you can see the main innovative uh, novel part was the non-invasive gaze tracking. And uh, this is a uh, diagram of the architecture uh, of the two systems. So the semi-autonomous system means the visa of all system. Why I call it semi-autonomous? Because the therapist needs, needed to monitor the behavior of the participant. However, the robot could do something autonomously. But still, the whole system was not fully autonomous. And we replace the human therapist monitoring with autonomous gaze tracking to make the whole system completely autonomous. Uh, this is how the system looks like. The robot, two target monitors, and the, the participant was sitting here. Okay? And you can also see a few cameras. Those cameras were used for gaze tracking. So as I mentioned, the gaze tracking um, 
was the major part and was the most difficult part. So why it is difficult? Uh, traditionally, if people need to do gaze tracking, they use eye trackers. Did you see eye trackers somewhere? Then you probably know that in order to use a commercial eye tracker, you will need to do calibration, right? And during the calibration, the participant's head is held there, and then uh, uh, the screen needs to display a full calibration point, and the participant look at the cali uh, calibration point one by one. After this calibration, the participant again uh, needs to hold their head pose, cannot move, and uh, just move their eye gaze in order to do precise eye tracking. And once they turn their head around, that's mess up the calibration, and you know, the eye tracker will not be effective. However, uh, if you look at the interaction environment, you will see that we need the participant to look around. So we do not want them to hold their hands. So we cannot use an eye tracker. Instead, uh, we um, programmed, um, uh, we did some computer vision programming and we developed our own algorithms to use um, a person's Head, frontal head orientation to approximate the gaze direction of this person. I see approximation instead of directly using the head pose, and I will tell you why. The first step is to do head orient, uh, orientation estimation. I will not go through each detail because uh, this is probably out of the scope of this presentation. But basically, uh, it is a minimization problem and uh, we can detect landmarkers automatically using computer vision, landmarkers on the, on the face using computer vision techniques. And when the orientation of the participant with respect to camera changes, the distribution of the landmarkers also changes according to the change of head pose, right? And by studying, uh, studying the distribution, analyzing the distribution of those landmarkers, we can calculate, we can compute what is the corresponding head orientation. That is the first step. And the second step uh, is we want to solve the problem because in order, uh, there's a problem in order to track a person's head orientation, we have to uh, see the near frontal image of this participant. So for example, if this is the camera, I'm, I'm looking at a camera, oh yes, the camera can catch my frontal face and do the estimation. But if I turn away from the camera, the camera cannot see my frontal face and thus cannot track my head orientation. How to solve the problem? The way is to add another camera here, right? So if this camera cannot catch my uh, frontal face, and this one can. So I used four cameras uh, to make sure that no matter where the participants was looking within the interaction environment, at least one camera could catch the frontal face and, uh, uh, and, 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 and did the head orientation estimation accordingly. So we designed a bunch of algorithms as listed here, and uh, we first validate how accurate the head orientation estimation was done. <coughs> the red line is the grand truth, and the blue line is the head, or, uh, the head, pose, head orientation estimation uh, data recorded. So you can see in all yaw, pitch, and row, the estimation result are pretty precise. So you can see a little bit more off here, but the skill, the range of row is also smaller. So in general, 
the accuracy looks like this. It's not too bad. Can yes. you also give us the time frame so when they move, how fast, uh, basically the camera, or how long? Uh, um, so the time yeah. frame, I want to see, like, is it in seconds that the camera can capture that? Oh, the camera refresh, I think, uh, at least 15 frames per second, the camera system. So that's, that's fast enough to capture any rotation, movement. yes, movement. And then uh, we find that when people are looking in the near frontal direction, yes, you can use uh, the head orientation to indicate their gaze direction. However, if they uh, shift the gaze away from the frontal direction to the side, largely, and then the head orientation does not really align with the gaze direction. So, I am looking at you. This is my gaze direction naturally, and this is my head orientation. So you can see that there is a big difference between the two. Then how to solve the problem? Again, we recruited a bunch of participants, and we display a moving marker, and the marker moves from this side to that side, and then we use the camera system to capture their head orientation. The position of the moving marker was treated as the ground truth of their gaze direction because we asked them to stare at the moving marker as much as possible. And then we did regression and fitted a curve between the, the uh, frontal head orientation and their gaze direction. And you can see the red line was the curve applied in the system, and the shape itself is quite nonlinear. Okay. So first, detect the height orientation, and then extend the detection range, and then convert the height orientation into the gaze direction. So now the system is ready to go. The interaction logic, or the prompting hierarchy, looks like this. So initially, the robot asked the, the child, look, if there's no response, the robot add more hints, like uh, look over there, more words, right? And also, the target uh, display different things. Initially, static picture, not quite interesting. And if there's no response, there was no response, the target may dis display audio or video. So from prompt level one to prompt level six, the stimuli are, were higher, uh, stronger, and stronger. Okay? And this is called a least to most prompting hierarchy, which has been applied in psychology and education a lot. Um, this this uh, table is very intuitive, but this is in human language. So the question is, how can we uh, um, interpret this logic and implement that in the robot? So we need to convert, translate the table into something a machine can understand. And this is a pseudocode, a piece of pseudocode to implement that hierarchy. And different commands, different lines shows the input and output of different system components. Uh, basically, we need to have a behavioral function uh, that is a, a function to describe the behavior of the participant. And then we have an interaction queue detection function. Uh, and then we have a prompting <coughs> function that works based on the output of the interaction queue detection. So using this interaction protocol, the least to most LTM interaction protocol, we have two goals. Uh, the first goal is um, we want to okay, we want to make sure that adding prompt levels increases the probability of expected response. There are six levels of prompts. 
And if the student, the, the not student, the participant's uh, uh, performance um, does not improve after prime level three, then it's meaningless to, to add prime level four, five, and six, right? So you want the sequence to be designed in a way that each one can help improve their performance. And at the highest prime level, the system can elicit expected response with high probability. This is the second goal. So we want to design the interaction protocol in a way that eventually the system can help these children hit the target. Hit target means turning, uh, looking at the monitor. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned, beyond interaction cue sensing and interaction protocol, uh, how to integrate everything together is a big task. And here I call it system integration. The information flow of the system looks like this. You have a target module to display static uh, pictures, audios, and videos. And then uh, you have a robot module to control the motion, the speech of the robot. And uh, the two uh, uh, output of the two modules uh, uh, was observed by the participant, and the participant's behavior was sensed by the gaze tracking, mo uh, gaze tracking module, and the output of gaze tracking module was input into a supervisory controller. So the supervisory controller actually controls the interaction protocol, okay, and send command to the target module and the robot module. So you can see here we form a closed loop interaction between the machine and the human. Okay? And this information flow seems easy, but if you want to implement the system, the real system, uh, more works are involved. This is a hierarchical state chart model that describes the scheduling and parallel processes uh, of the integration. I will not go into the details of the paragraph, I just, of this uh, diagram, but I just want to show you the potential complexity of integrating everything together. Okay. And this is just a, a, a figure uh, for one trial, and there were eight trials in one session, and there were four sessions. So you can imagine uh, the whole picture can be very, very complex. So, after the development of the system, we did another experimental study with 14 children with SD, and each of them, again, uh, had four repeated sessions on different uh, dates. Okay. Basically, we got the same result using this system as that of the wizard of system. So what does this mean? This means um, using the non-contact, non-invasive gaze tracking uh, um, uh, technology, we can achieve the same, uh, the same goal. Uh, we can uh, get the same good result uh, as, uh, as, as the, in the case where we hired a human ob uh, observer or controller, right? So we do not need to have them in the future, we just use the system. We just use the gaze tracking technology instead. And uh, the preferential attention did not change significantly, but their performance did change significantly. And the, less, uh, the, the lower the prime level is, the better the performance is. So. And this graph shows uh, we achieved the two goals of the interaction protocol. You can see when the prompt level increased, the target hit probability also increased. And uh, eventually, at the highest prompt level, the target hit prob probability almost uh, uh, reaches one. So one is the maximum. Right? It's a 100% uh, 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 target hit rate. So two goals were achieved. 
Um, so you already observed a case study for joint attention. That was not the only system that I developed. Following the same methodologies, designing interaction cue sensing, designing um, proper interaction protocols, and uh, do good system integration, you can uh, design and develop uh, many different types of intervention systems. Um, so this is an imitation learning system for children with SD. And I, I also developed um, virtual reality systems to recognize how people with autism recognize other people's facial expressions. Okay? Uh, and this is another figure shows uh, a social orienting intervention system that I developed. Uh, so basically, the system can present social communication stimuli uh, in different temporal and spatial distribution, and we can access children's behavior within this system. So you can see this type of research has two contributions. First, we have technical contributions, right? We designed a system, and we did this and that. We did a lot of programming and data analysis. And it also contributes to the signs of ASD intervention. First, we understand how human and how, or how, hum, uh, how children with autism, they interact with machine with something that is not human. Okay? And uh, secondly, we observed interesting cognitive and behavioral patterns in these children when they were interacting with the machines. So there are a few future works. This graph shows, can you guess what is this? What's this? Yes, facial expression recognition. So it will be cool if we can also recognize children's facial expression while we are tracking this, their gaze direction, right? Because our cognitive status, our behavioral uh, status, uh, most of them can be reflected by uh, facial expression. So we may want to introduce more advanced detection cue detection methods in the systems. And then we want to uh, model the interaction dynamics between the machine and the, uh, the subjects. Uh, this is very important. So uh, why it is important? Uh, first, as I uh, demonstrated, the IOTM interaction protocol. There are many things existing in psychology, but how to implement them into hardware, we need some translation, and that is mathematical modeling. And again, people's behavior in short-term human-machine interaction is different uh, from, a, from that in longitudinal human-machine interaction. So imagine that you buy a new iPhone. On the first day, you play it for a long time, right? And then gradually, after two years, you get used to it, and you can put it anywhere, right? So it's, it's different. Um, and we want to do individualized interaction. This is important because autism spectrum disorder, this disorder is a spectrum. The spectrum means one participant can be quite different from the other. We cannot design the same thing that is suitable for each individual. So it will be good if we can create a model, create a system that can treat different patients differently. And again, we, we want to investigate uh, the skill generalization. So what does this mean? Eventually, we want to help these children to be able to interact with human being well, instead of interact with machines well, right? So machines, the human-machine interaction is just uh, a procedure or a tool to help them uh, gain more uh, skills 
and to implement those skills in real life when they interact with their parents, with their classmates, with other people, other real people. So that is called a skill, uh, the skill generalization. Um, so this slide, I want to give you <laughs> um, some ideas uh, about what the inspirations of, of my research on the mental health care in general. So the first thing I want to mention is we need to understand people's expectations. So a lot of people ask me, do you think in the future robot can replace human therapist? And my answer is no, 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 no. We, that's not possible. <laughs> and this is because, um, yes, technology is powerful when, when we use it to investigate a very single specific point, okay? But humans' cognition, humans' behaviors are so complex and comprehensive, I haven't seen any technology can handle such comprehensive knowledge very well. I can give you an example. Yes, we can use gaze direction to indicate people's attention. Now I'm turning back. I'm watching at this black uh, whiteboard. But my attention is still on you, right? Because I'm doing a presentation, right? So in order to fully understand people's behavior, people's intention, you have to consider many, many environmental factors. And uh, this research is interdisciplinary research. It's a collaboration between engineers and psychologists. Engineering and psychology, two completely different subjects. The same word can mean different things in, 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 in people in two separate uh, areas. So I can give you an example. Uh, when I did my PhD study, once um, uh, a psychologist asked me to um, uh, design a wave motion on a robot, wave, then I was thinking about how can I define a wave on the robot? What should be the angle, right? What should be the, the head, of the, head of, the, uh, of the hand? So all these things automatically turns uh, turn into numbers in my mind. And so, you know, that's, this means the conversation between the two sides of, is very important. And also, specific engineering design development. I also, uh, I, I already introduced that we need to make sure that the system is engaging. So if we present such robot to a children with autism, then I guess the kid will run away immediately, right? <laughs> So actually, we use a robot looks like this, okay? And how many minutes do I have? Okay. Okay. And so, let me quickly talk about something else. Uh, it's also important to consider our population and what type of disease are we dealing with. So. We, if we are dealing with ASD, we want to solve social communication problems. If we are designing a, a system um, to help children with ADHD, then probably we, we are dealing with attention problems, right? If we are designing a system to help people with social phobia, then we want to create similar different social communication scenario, scenarios. And we also need to pay attention on the age and gender of our participants. Like for example, uh, the, here the, the, the black line shows the different emotions of adults. This is one of my recent work. And the red line shows the face uh, of, of children. It looks quite similar, right? Uh, between, so the, the, the expressions between children and uh, adults looks quite similar. There, there are differences, but not too much. However, if you use technology, if you, you, if you train machine learning classifiers to classify, to recognize those different emotions, then there is problem. I use the same algorithm, a support, support vector machine, and I train classifiers uh, using adult data and test that using adult data. The result is not bad, okay? 
And I trained classifier using children's data and tested classifier using children's data. And yes, it's good again. However, many existing systems, they use programs trained with adult data to recognize children's faces. And I simulated the same scenario. You see the accuracy drops. Okay? In this case, the, the, um, the disgust uh, expression of children is even recognized as angry using the adult classifiers. So this is wrong. And then I did a reverse study. How about we, we use the classifiers trained with children's data and then use that to recognize adult facial expressions? It's completely messed up. It does not work at all. So it's very important for us to understand the population. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the syst systematic integration and fusion is very important. Like uh, in my small scale studies, the figures already look pretty complex. And now if I involve more factors like more interaction queue, uh, sensing, more uh, uh, complex interaction protocols, then probably the network lo looks very complex and, and, and it, it does need expertise to handle such complexity. So in the next five to 10 years, we would like to do three things. First is we, we want to extend the user study. In almost all the research articles, in the conclusion discussion section, you will see a limitation of this study is this small sample size. That exists in almost all the research articles. Um, there are a few reasons, but uh, if we can encourage community participation more, then we can recruit more children, and we can get more data, and thus we can develop a better technology. And again, we want to encourage industrial collaboration in this research. Uh, like for example, the robot that I, I used cost nine thousand uh, dollars. It includes twenty. Uh, it has twenty-five degrees freedom. It has different sensors and bumpers, sonar, and cameras. However, in my study, I only used the motors on the arms, and I didn't use any of the sensor in the robot. So, which means the dollars are wasted, right? Probably I just need one k. From the night, from the night case, right? So if we can develop some uh, other robots that own, that's just suitable for our intervention, not with extra uh, non-used hardwares, then we can achieve lower cost, right? And of course, such such research benefit the, con the, uh, the community in the future when the technology is more mature. Uh, we may apply them at home and in clinic, right? And we also want to get more feedback from real life application instead of in the lab setting. Okay. And uh, last, I want to acknowledge my sponsors, NIH, NSF, Vanderbilt, Michigan Tech University. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. I can pass the microphone if anybody has questions. Okay, can you? It's a long pass. Yes. Yes, th thank you for, for this presentation. Very interesting research. Was there a selection criterion in the autistic kids for, for severity of the autism? Uh, so for my uh, experimental study? Yes. No, there's no restrictions. So I did uh, about 300 sessions uh, across the whole spectrum, low functioning and high functioning. And yes, we did observe differences uh, uh, in different experimental setups. So sometimes we find that technology can help low functioning children better. And sometimes we find another piece of technology can help high-functioning children better. So it all depends. 
But, but what about things that might be disruptive to the experiment, like, like violent behavior or, or severely autistic children wear diapers? Um, it might be difficult. Yes, it could be difficult. And actually, well, you know, my participants were uh, two to five years old. So it, it's a little bit easier for me to handle <laughs> their behaviors. But still, I sometimes I got scratches and bruises and during the experiment. But those are uh, kind of expected. And we want to develop robust technology. We want to build a system in a way that can tolerate such um, behaviors eventually. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, yes. Uh, I had two questions. Um, one was kind of going off that point. Did you do all the testing, like, same time of day? Like, uh, you know, had they just eaten before or something? Like, did these kind of things matter at all for, like, the results? Like, did you see any change from doing a test in the morning versus the afternoon? Like, if that kid had interaction before during the day or not? Uh, yes. Like, if they were exhausted? It's, very, it's a very good question. Actually, in my experimental studies, I did not uh, separate participants, or I, did, I didn't set up a particular time for the participant to, to get into a lab. Uh, because it's difficult, the participant, sometimes the family, they drive two hours to the lab. So I cannot set up very strict constraints. But we did observe that if, like, a two-year-old uh, wanted to have a nap, and then we asked them to do an interaction session, and the result was horrible. <laughs> yeah. That happened. Gotcha. And, and did you do any like questionnaire exit or entry questionnaire about like their state that day or like that week? Like if it was a good day, bad day? Like because um, sometimes it can vary. We didn't do the survey for that particular day. Um, but uh, we did standard uh, psychological assessment on their mental status, behavior status uh, in general. Okay. That includes the history in the past and the recent behaviors. Gotcha. But not necessarily the, the, on the same day. Yeah. I gotcha. And then um, I was wondering, uh, ha, did, did it appear viable to be able to replace um, the robot, uh, or your camera system, in a sense, with sensors on the robot, like especially if you're using something that expensive. So then if it's just the robot together, like if someone wants to use this at home with uh, their kid, then they can just whenever, wherever they play with the robot, like it's set up instead of a big <coughs> camera rig or something. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a good idea. And I think it is possible um, because I purchased a commercial version. I cannot break the robot and in yeah. my own hardware inside. But I think eventually, with the help from industry, we can uh, uh, implement a new robot with, a f with better uh, cameras or with, even with stereo cameras that can be used to sense the behaviors of children better. Gotcha. Yes. Um, well, I have another question. Did you try on uh, normal children? I mean, did the, the same results are achieved? Yes, so uh, we call them typically developing children, TD group, and that is the control group uh, when we did our experimental study. And we observed, um, in, in almost all the experiments, we observed different results in the TD group and children with ASD. I have a short question. Yes. I'm thinking about the four camera that you mentioned, you know, for gaze and mm -hmm. then the um, facial direction. So how did you choose four? And then I'm thinking, is it, uh, because it's the discrete number of cameras, yeah. would it be helpful if you just use an array of detectors as opposed to like discrete number of uh, cameras? Yeah. How did you choose and would it, you know, matter in the final? So it's a, detection? it's a very good question. Uh, allow me to draw a graph here. So if here is a camera, the camera has a, a view angle. So how many cameras can we put depends on the overlap of the view angle. We want the participant's head can be covered in this range. 
So for each camera, uh, the head orientation estimation, usually if, uh, if the head orientation is near the front, the accuracy is higher. And as the, right. the head turns, the accuracy decreases. Mm -hmm. So we also want to make sure that uh, we do not use the, the, the edge of the detection range. Uh, so this does not mean the more computer, the more cameras, the better, because in order to drive each camera, there is computation cost, and uh, the more camera we have, the lower the system will be. So we want to balance the number and the performance. The yeah. Sounds good. There is no other question. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you.